Thank you very much. Let me know if the microphone is not working. It sounds like it is from here. So thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, Bishop Conley. It's a delight to be back. I was here for the, um, for the dedication in April, which was a wonderful event. And uh, this venture that you're beginning, this uh, Newman Institute, is surely a great, great venture. So I'm happy to help out in, in any way that I can. Um, I want to thank also the students that came to the class uh, this afternoon. We had a great session on T.S. Eliot. And uh, one of them said she didn't know there was that much contained in so short a poem. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming. So in the second act of Hamlet, uh, scene two, the aggrieved and angry Prince of Denmark, he's delighted to welcome to town a company of players, jugglers, actors, entertainers. And the prince is, most of you have read Hamlet somewhere along the line, I suspect. The prince is angry and aggrieved because he suspects that his father has been murdered. And also, he's concerned that his mother has too hastily remarried after the death of his father. So he welcomes the players to Elsinore, the capital, the royal castle. And he tells the king's counselor, Polonius, to, uh, to look after them during their stay. My lord, says Polonius, I will use them according to their desert. At which point, Hamlet explodes. Hmm? God's Botkin man use every man according to his desert, and who shall scape whipping? Hmm? In plain English or modern English, if everyone was, were judged on merit alone, on what we deserved, none of us could stand before God justified. All would suffer punishment. Indeed, some would suffer the second death of damnation. Hmm? So Ham Hamlet is angry at this. Um, so this exchange sets the stage, if you, if you will, for a reflection on tonight's topic. And the talk is titled, as you heard, As the Gentle Rain from Heaven, Shakespeare's Heart of Mercy. That's a quote that comes from Portia's magnificent courtroom scene in The Merchant of Venice. And more on that in a little while. I have chosen this subject, Shakespeare's Heart of Mercy, for for two reasons. First, contemporary critics have a tendency to emphasize or overemphasize the raw side of Shakespeare. Isn't he the consummate realist, they argue, the one who gives us really gritty characters, like the tyrant Richard III, remember him? Or Iago from Othello, malevolent in his heart. Or the ambitiously wicked Macbeth and his equally ambitiously wicked wife, Lady Macbeth. Hmm? So in their way of thinking, this is a man, Shakespeare, who doesn't look at life through rose-colored glasses. No? Um, that's true. Uh, he looks at the world, they say, as it is, without fabricated hope or optimism. But it's only half the story, half the story concerning uh, Shakespeare. And this uh, strain of criticism says more about the critics' hearts than, in fact, it does about Shakespeare himself. In fact, you might say that the greatest poet playwright of the English-speaking world, and not just the English-speaking world, but world literature in general, is not the skeptic or the cynic that many claim he is. On the contrary, Shakespeare has, as I tell my students at Wyoming Catholic College, a genesis vision of reality. In other words, a vision that sees the world as good, indeed, as very good. Hmm? And he maintains this hopeful vision while fully recognizing all that creation suffers, the deep wound of our fallen humanity, what the desperate and despairing Macbeth characterizes as life's sad tale, uh, told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Hmm? Critics confuse Macbeth, despairing at the end of his life, with Shakespeare. And they ought not do so, because they're two different, two different characters. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So don't confuse the two, as some do. Um, 
And some critics or readers of Shakespeare fall into this trap again and again, including someone as talented as our own contemporary William Faulkner, you know, who uses that title, Sound and the Fury, uh, to a very despairing book, a very dark book. And Faulkner, you might say, was a child of his time, and therefore, well, a child, you know, uh, not having the maturity of vision that someone like Shakespeare had. Um, like Thomas More, Shakespeare was a man for all seasons. He was broad in his field of vision. He was universal in outlook, Catholic with a small c, perhaps Catholic with a large c, but we won't go there tonight. <laughs> Even though that theory has made many critics a lot of money and made them very popular, I'm not so sure that it completely holds water. Uh, but in the words of Ben Jonson, one of his contemporaries and a playwright in his own right, um, Shakespeare was, quote, not of an age, but for all time, hmm? universal. John Dryden, who comes after Ben Jonson, says the following significantly. Shakespeare was, quote, the man who of all modern and perhaps ancient poets had the <coughs> largest and most comprehensive soul. Hmm? Think about that for a moment. The largest and most comprehensive soul. <clears throat> If this is true, it should come as no surprise that Shakespeare's heart and the heart of his poetry speaks frequently and movingly of mercy, uh, what St. John Paul the Great has referred to as love's second name. Mercy is love's second name, that for, from his encyclical Divas in Misericordia. So my first reason for speaking this evening about Shakespeare's heart of mercy is to defend him from critics who would misread or misunderstand his work, who would impose on this most Catholic and comprehensive of writers a circumscribed vision of wisdom. That's my first reason. But there's a second reason for choosing my topic. In less than a month's time, as you know, the church on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception will begin the extraordinary jubilee of mercy hmm? very, very soon. Pope Francis first announced this jubilee last November when he wrote about it at length in, in uh, and then he later wrote about it at length in Misericordiae Vultus, or The Face of Mercy. And the Holy Father begins that papal bull in this way. Jesus Christ is the face of the Father's mercy. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is the face of the Father's mercy. A face, he goes on to say, that men and women of our time desperately long to see. This longing is, of course, nothing new. It's been around from the beginning. The Psalms speak often of this same longing. Vultum tuum domine requira. Lord, I long to see your face. And this holy longing defines who we are as human beings, created by, for, and in love. And we know that this love, uh, this lack of love, this longing for love, uh, makes us incurably restless, as St. Augustine says, uh, until we rest in God or until we rest in, in love itself. Pope Francis continues, and this and this and other quotes are, some of them are contained in the handout that has been circulated. He says in Misericordiae Vultus, we need constantly to contemplate the mystery of mercy. It is a wellspring of joy, serenity, and peace. Our salvation depends on it. And then he lists a series of anaphoras, repetitions, about what mercy is. Mercy, the word reveals the very mystery of the most holy trinity. Mercy, the ultimate and supreme act by which God comes to meet us. Mercy, the fundamental law that dwells in the heart of every person. Mercy, the bridge that connects God and man, opening our hearts to the hope of being loved forever, despite our sinfulness. 
how much, you might say, we need to understand, to contemplate, and to practice this virtue, which is more, after all, than simply a virtue, but rather a way of life, a very habit of being. By, before reflecting on three episodes from Shakespeare, let me say a few things about mercy itself. The philosopher Dietrich von Hildebrand says that, quote, mercy is a specifically divine virtue. Like love, it relates to, is, is a theological virtue related directly to God. Only God is merciful, st strictly speaking. When we human beings are merciful, we're merciful only in an analogous way. We participate in the mercy of God. In Shakespeare's peerless language, earthly power does then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. So this second name for love, to borrow St. John Paul's words, is to say, as it were, that mercy is akin to love, like love, the greatest of the theological virtues and the one most often identified with God himself. St. John the Evangelist teaches that he who does not love God does not know God, for God is love, in 1 John. And this is a bedrock teaching, is it not, of our shared Christian faith, what von Hildebrand calls a, quote, central point of revelation. Central point of revelation. When Shakespeare says that mercy seasons justice, he recognizes in that beautiful image an intimate relationship between mercy and justice. Recently, I talked about this passage for my students at Wyoming Catholic, a freshman class, and I asked them to try to unpack it, to try to understand it. And one of them, being Wyoming, a place where meat is popular, one of them said, well, it's as if, um, it's as if you have a slab of unseasoned meat, good in and of itself, and along you come with the pepper and the salt. And I said, that's exactly what Shakespeare means. That's exactly the image that he wants you to see. That mercy, mercy seasons, gives flavor to, brings out the fullness of life in, in what is there uh, related to mercy, which is, which is justice. So as a Christian humanist in the same category of genius as Thomas More, as Erasmus, as Juan Luis Vives, as Cervantes himself, Shakespeare reiterates a commonplace in Christendom, namely that mercy is to justice what grace is to nature. Hmm? The one builds on the other, the foundation of the other. One virtue is supernatural, the other natural. But, and this is the essential point, the two complement each other like male and female, as it were. We see this clearly in St. Thomas Aquinas, who in his Summa um, replies to those who say that mercy is a relaxation of justice. Mercy is softness compared to the hard uh, realities of justice. Um, which, by the way, is what the insecure or those insecure in power will often say when comparing mercy and justice. Huh? The, uh, the Havers of this world, for those of you who know Victor Hugo, the one who maintains that justice should be carried out at all times, huh? and that mercy is a kind of falling away, a softness, a sentimentality. Well, this is what Thomas says about mercy and justice. He says, God acts mercifully, not indeed by going against his justice, but by doing something more than justice. Thus a man who pays another 200 pieces of money, though owing him only 100, does nothing against justice, but acts liberally and mercifully. This case is the same when one pardons an offense committed against him. For in remitting, he may be said to bestow a gift. Hence it is clear, Thomas continues, that mercy does not destroy justice but in a sense is the fullness thereof. And thus it is said, mercy exalteth itself above judgment. That from the epistle of James. 
So mercy is primordial. primordial. It's older than justice since love exists before the law. You know? And love is eternal. Justice is not. If I'm wrong in this, the theologians in the room will set me straight afterwards. Uh, love is infinite. No. Uh, justice uh, is finite. The works of mercy will pass away. Um, but the workings of love are without end. Endless. The Old Testament, especially the book of Psalms, along with the New Testament, reminds us that mercy is like God himself, present from the beginning, and is destined to remain long after each created be being has received its due. In other words, when justice has run its course. Remember, O Lord, your mercy and love, for they are of old, the psalmist tells us. And this is the very same mercy that endures forever in another psalm, or the mercy that is from generation to generation on those who fear him, from Luke's gospel. So Shakespeare captures this wonderfully in one of his sonnets, Sonnet 116, one of the most anthologized sonnets because it's about love. And he compares love, that second name uh, for mercy, to an ever-fixed mark. No? A guiding light that looks upon tempests and is never shaken. It is the star, he says, to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Uh, in order to determine a ship's whereabouts, uh, today as well as in days of old, the mariner used the sextant, the instrument which measured the distance between a star and a fixed point on the horizon. And he did this to determine where the ship was on the map. I know we have some old Navy folks in here, so you'll know exactly what I mean. No? So the, the mariner uses this. This measurement tells the mariner where the ship is, but it says nothing about the magnificence of the star itself. No? Shining for God knows, literally, how long, illuminating the dark grandeur of the night sky. Um, and there is something about the very nature of love, mercy, that renders it more beautiful, more mysterious, and more eternal than any star in the firmament. Hmm? Love alters not with his, with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom, the sonnet goes on to say. Love is unchanging, unchangeable. The units of chronological time, days, weeks, hours, mean nothing to it. Love and mercy is like God, eternal and without end. So far, I've attempted to establish something about the nature of mercy, though I have certainly not exhausted the topic. Nor could I, no? Since it is one of those realities that leaves us, to use a phrase from T.S. Eliot, really in the dark. It's a mystery. Love and mercy go beyond the realm of reason. And the most rational among us, I think of the French philosopher Blaise Pascal, realized that reason has its limitations. The most highly developed form of reason is still insufficient to comprehend the reality of the universe, the reality of God. For love and mercy is that greatest and grandest mystery of human life. In Dante's words, it is that which moves the sun and other stars. L'amor che muove il sole, l'altre stelle. Uh, the very beginning of everything, the first mover, to use Aristotle's phrase. So I want to turn now to Shakespeare himself. And as I reflect on the following three episodes, I ask you to join with me in this reflection. I want to keep in the back of our minds, though, Questions that arise throughout history, but arise with special intensity in our own time. And these questions are three. Of what possible use is poetry? What can imaginative literature teach us? Wouldn't we be better off studying fact rather than mere fiction? I sometimes dream of a 
conversation. It's a nightmare of my old wrestling coach from New Jersey, whose name was Artie Statissimo. And Artie was born in Hoboken, New Jersey, in the shadow of Manhattan. And he spoke with a very thick uh, uh, Jersey accent. You know? um, he, he was famous to us, uh, to student wrestlers, because he was, a, he was an extra in Marlon Brando's On the Waterfront when they filmed, <laughs> when they filmed that on the docks. And I often imagine him saying to me in his uh, typical way, so free, what is poetry anyway? No, get real, uh, get a life. Yeah. Um, and if he had been privy to a poetic education, he may well have asked something like, get off the mat of life and be a man in perfect iambic pentameter. But of course, but of course, Artie had not had the perfect poetic ed education, although he was a wonderful man for all that. Um, so these are questions, I might add, found not only on the lips of pragmatic and practical-minded men and women, but most people ask them. I could ask for a show of hands. I, I won't. That's always embarrassing for an audience. Um, but. Um, I hear these questions often about the use of poetry, especially teaching as I do at Wyoming Catholic College, which, for those who don't know, offers only one degree, a degree in liberal arts. No chemistry, no computer programming, uh, no business, no finance, um, simply the great books, hmm? starting with uh, the Old and New Testament, and moving through Homer and Dante and Shakespeare, Virgil, Augustine, Aquinas, and so forth. Um, and even your own native uh, Willa Cather, who is probably, to my thinking, one of the most underrated of American writers. You should really, if you haven't read her, you should. She's a wonderful writer. Um, so this degree in liberal arts um, doesn't have any obvious practical application or any future job security. In other words, every parent's nightmare. Right? <laughs> I will, uh, just as a way of plugging the college, I will say that our four graduating classes so far, uh, people have done very well. Uh, some are in Clear Creek Monastery, some are uh, I involved in Focus, some are police officers in Lander, Wyoming, because they chose to stay. So all of them are gainfully employed or in graduate school. No one, as far as I've heard, is out on the threshold in Chicago or San Francisco looking for work. Uh, so so, so these, three, these three episodes, the first one I want to talk about is the play Measure for Measure, which of the plays that I mention is probably the least, least read play. And in that play, the Duke, um, Vincencio, he leaves the city of Vienna, and before he does so, he entrusts his power to an upright young man, a counselor called Angelo, a man of strictest morals, and a man who is known for his practice of justice. Now, Angelo is clearly something of a prig, you know, and Shakespeare presents him in that way. He's convinced of his own virtue, he's self-righteous, and therefore not especially mild with respect to the faults and failings of others. We heard in that prayer for the year of mercy, make us aware of our own faults so that we might be compassionate with the faults and failings of others. He's like the gospel's Pharisee, head raised high before God, thankful that he is not like the rest of men. But he is, as Shakespeare describes him, uh, playing on his very name, an angel on the outward side. Hmm? He has the appearance of virtue, the appearance of goodness, but there's something missing inside the heart, something lacking. Hmm? And there's a corruption, you might say, in the cup beneath the external glowing alabaster, uh, to use that image from scripture. And as any good confessor, will tell you in this room that pride magnifies the sins of others, no, and blinds us to our own. That's the effect, one of the effects of pride. So what follows is this. As I say, um, 
Uh, I'll review the plot. Some of you have read it, but for the sake of those who haven't, I'll review it uh, briefly. The Duke leaves town, entrusts power to his viceroy, uh, Angelo, and immediately faces the case of a young man who is guilty of a capital offense. He, this young man, Claudio, commits fornication. He sleeps with his betrothed before marriage. Hmm? This is obviously a, a different time, you know? I could comment, I won't, I could comment on the state of current culture using words from John Milton, oh, how unlike the place from whence we fell. Mm -hmm. uh, so this young man, he's awaiting execution. He enlists the help of his sister, Isabella, who is a novice in a religious order. Uh, it's interesting to think about Shakespeare's plays, so many of them are set in Catholic cultures, you know? And he ends up talking about priests and religious and confession and the sacraments, which, is, which gives rise to one of the theories that he was, in fact, a, 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 closet, a closet Catholic. Uh, so he approaches, uh, Claudio approaches his, his sister, and he says, go before the viceroy Plead my case. He'll, he'll respect you. You're a woman of great virtue. You're a religious. He'll respect what you have to say. Um, so he goes before, uh, she goes before Angelo, and uh, Claudio says, no, I'm a man of justice. He must suffer the penalty of death. He committed fornication, which in Vienna is a capital offense. Your brother, he says, is a forfeit of the law. Uh, in other words, he has forfeited his right to life because of this crime, because of this sin. So listen now to Isabella's response, which is, which is in your handout. And it recalls Hamlet's quoted line that if each of us were judged before God on merit alone, in other words, on justice alone, none of us should escape whipping. None of us should escape punishment. Isabella's response to the Duke, the strict Duke, the champion of justice, why all the souls that were, were forfeit once, and he that might the vantage best have took found out the remedy. How would you be if he, which is the top of judgment, should but judge you as you are? Oh, think on that, and mercy then will breathe within your lips like man new made. All men and women suffer, as we know, from the wound of original sin. It's one of those teachings of the church that needs little in the way of apologetics. No? Uh, just look around. Look around at ourselves. No? There are no exceptions. And because of this wound, there is a tendency to sin, and the actual sins follow. No? Isabella's argument is persuasive. The one who is judge, God himself, Note the, the capitalized pronoun that appears twice in the passage, he, referring to God. God, as the judge, could in justice find fault with any one of us, no? But he, God, found out the remedy for this problem. That is, the incarnation and the redemption. Hmm? Jesus, dwelling among us as man, suffering and dying for our sins, interceding on our behalf, instituting a new law of mercy to complement the strict requirement of justice. We speak admiringly of the Aristotelian sense of justice, giving to each man or woman their due. Hmm? And we should admire that. It's a great principle. But none of us, with any degree of self-knowledge, would want that same standard applied to us when it comes to our relationship with God, no? We need more than justice. What we need is mercy. Mm -hmm. So in her argument to Angelo, Isabella reminds the young viceroy that he too stands as a sinner. If only he can recognize this in humility, then mercy will breathe in his words, and he will be like a new creation, a man new made. But her heart fails to speak to his, which remains cold 
and unmoved. As the play continues, Angelo suddenly develops an attraction to Isabella. Her very virtue attracts him, arouses, uh, arouses lust on his part. And he attempts to pervert justice by offering to commute Claudio's sentence on condition that she agree to sleep with him. Hmm? So you have the great, the great promoter of justice, the great man of virtue imploding, morally collapsing on himself because he's blindsided, as we often are, by temptation, this time blindsided by the temptation to lust. So the one who begins the play convinced of his own virtue and convinced also of the need to punish vice in others collapses. He, he falls with that fall that follows from pride. As Shakespeare says, power changes purpose. Mm -hmm. And the scholastic adage comes to pass, corruptio optimi pessima. The corruption of the, of the best is the worst. In Angelo, we see repeated a type of, of Lucifer, no? A contingent being who is deluded into believing that he is somehow complete, in need of nothing beyond himself. It is the pride of Pelagianism, a heresy that resurfaces time and again in human history. Those who have not read the play uh, called one of Shakespeare's dark comedies because it's not, after all, an amusing tale, at least through most of it. You'll be happy to learn that the Duke returns to Vienna. He exposes Angelo's hypocrisy. Claudio's death sentence is commuted. Order restored. A new age of mercy ensues. And as is equally the case in Shakespeare, uh, there is forgiveness, celebration, and the promise of new life, and especially lots of marriages, which is the way <laughs> Shakespeare's comedies and romances end. Huh? So Claudio uh, gets to marry his betrothed. Um, Angelo is, is compelled to marry a, a woman that he had previously jilted because her dowry was not large enough. So it tells us something more about this just and this precise man. And even, um, even the Duke, who becomes attracted to Isabella, proposes to her, and in good Protestant fashion, opts for marriage rather than consecrated life. <laughs> so, so the play concludes with, with those who have been unjustly treated, begging for mercy from the one who has mistreated them. The jilted woman, her name is Mariana, um, she says, pleads before the, the Duke on her knees, something very interesting that's always stuck with me in Shakespeare. She says, best men are molded out of faults and for the most become much the better for being a little bad. Best men are molded out of faults and for the most become much better for being a little bad. And what is that but the recognition the self-knowledge that comes of our own weakness and sin. And because of that, we begin then to be compassionate, merciful towards others. So we become be better men and women when we recognize our own, our own sins. The play then fulfills the promise of its title taken from Matthew 7. Do not judge that you may not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. With what measure you measure, it shall be measured to you. So Angelo is that man with the beam in his eye. He's rendered unable to deal with the speck in the eye of another. And each of us, Shakespeare suggests, is in danger of becoming an Angelo, that angel on the outward side that sees so clearly the sins of others but is blind to our own sin. We find the same theme of mercy and forgiveness reworked powerfully in The Tempest, which is one of Shakespeare's final plays. So this is interesting because over the course of 20 years as a playwright, Shakespeare returns again and again to the theme of mercy and its relationship to justice. Uh, and again, please allow me to review the plot. Some of you have read it, but for those who haven't. In this case, there's another Duke. Prospero of Milan, and he suffers 
betrayal at the hands of his ambitious brother called Antonio. Uh, the followers of Antonio, they take, they steal the dukedom from Prospero and his infant daughter Miranda, they put, he, they, they're put in a, in a leaking boat, a boat that's barely seaworthy, presumably uh, thinking that it will sink in Prospero and the line of Prospero will be forever destroyed, removed, you know? Um, so what happens is Prospero miraculously and Miranda end, end up safely on a deserted island in the Mediterranean. Um, not that there were any deserted islands in the Mediterranean, even in Shakespeare's day, but this is the, uh, this is the logic of the romances, the late plays, no? And on that island, for a dozen years, Prospero studies and perfects a kind of white magic which allows him to control the weather, the sea, and the sky. The play is considered one of, uh, again, Shakespeare's romances, and so seems less realistic than the tragedies. I say seems because, in fact, the romances are Shakespeare's way of speaking about transcendent realities. But that's a whole other lecture, so we won't go there at the moment. Um, so, on a certain day, there's a ship that's carrying the king of Naples, who colluded with his brother, Antonio, close to the island. Prospero raises a storm. The ship sinks, and those on board end up on the same island with Prospero. Now he has his enemies within striking distance. He has power over them. In justice, he has a right certainly to recover his dukedom, but also to punish the king of Naples and his treacherous brother. So he's on the verge of inflicting this punishment. He's wrestling with it in conscience. However, he has a change of heart, a conversion. In the dialogue that follows, which is also on your handout, Prospero listens attentively to Ariel, one of the spirits who faithfully serves him. And Ariel uh, says the following. I won't read it all. I'll read parts of it, but it is from this passage. So Ariel says, the king, his brother and yours, abide all three distracted. They're disoriented on the island. Your charm so strongly works him that if you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. You would be compassionate. You would feel mercy for them. Prospero responds, dost thou think so, spirit? And Ariel says, mine would, sir, were I human. And Prospero then has that moment of conversion, and mine shall. Hast thou, which art but air, a touch of feeling of their afflictions, and shall not myself, one of their kind, that relish all as sharply passion as they, be kindlier moved than thou art? Though with their high wrongs I am struck to the quick, yet with my nobler reason against my fury do I take part. The rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. They being penitent, sorry for their sins, the sole drift of my purpose doth extend not a frown further. Hmm? The rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. Shakespeare uses the generic virtue here for the sake of poetic alliteration, virtue and vengeance, the sound of the V repeated. But what he means is the particular virtue of mercy and, and forgiveness, no? In the order of justice, as I said, he has every right to reclaim what is due to him and also to see that injustice is punished. He has every right to do that. But he's persuaded otherwise, significantly, by a spirit who is not unlike one of Abraham Lincoln's better angels. You know? he's, he's, he's persuaded to act otherwise. Like the unnamed character from one of Shakespeare's sonnets, Prof Prospero has the power to hurt, but will do none. He restrains himself. He, he's in a position of power, but he does not exercise that power. And as a result in that sonnet, he becomes the, quote, lord and owner of himself, a man of self-dominion, a man of power, a man of integrity. 
So Prospero has his dukedom restored. He forgives the offenders and surprise, surprise, marries off his daughter, Miranda, to the, to the, uh, king's, uh, to the, to the king's son, Ferdinand. So again, it ends in, in marriage, as it often does. Marriage is a sign of reconciliation and the new life that comes in the wake of mercy's soft waves, the beautiful waters of mercy. In the final lines of the play, Prospero, he stands alone on the stage, and he addresses the audience in what some critics see as Shakespeare's farewell to the stage. And this is in your handout. I'll read it again only partially. Now my charms are all o'erthrown, and what strength I have mine own, which is most faint. He's, he's putting off the power that he had. Let me not, since I have my dukedom got, and pardon the deceiver dwell in this bare island by your spell. But release me from my bands with the help of your good hands. Now I want spirits to enforce, art to enchant, and my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. As you from crimes would pardoned be, let your indulgence set me free. So note the diction, note the word choice here in this final passage. Pardoned, release, relieved, free or freeze, twice, pardoned again, indulgence, and of course, mercy itself. The heart of Shakespeare indeed is a heart of mercy. Since I, Prospero, or Shakespeare, have forgiven those who have offended me, please release me from this island, this isolated island of art of myself, and do it with your applause, with your good hands, but also with your prayers. Pray for me, I need, I need your prayer. For without forgiveness and grace, the grace that comes through prayer, Prospero's ending, like our own, is one of despair. So we come now to The Merchant of Venice, which, along with Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet, is one of Shakespeare's most popular plays. And in its poetic wisdom and concision, it tells us more about mercy and justice than many a long and tedious tome on the same. Seminarians may appreciate this. Huh? This, is, uh, this is wisdom, uh, wisdom boiled down to 22 lines, huh? and a lot more interesting than most uh, tracks on the subject, at least that I've read. I'm sure you have better, better reading materials than I had. Um, so it's what tells me, or what convinces me, of something the great Renaissance writer Philip Sidney said and the philosophers will jump all over me for this, but Philip Sidney says that poetry is the better teacher than philosophy or history. Hmm? I won't go there lest we you know, rouse, ruffle feathers, but poetry is the better teacher than philosophy or history. There's a good reason for that, but again, that's another, another lecture. So you know the story. How many people have read or seen The Merchant of Venice? Most of you, some of you, good. So you know the story, let me review it. A Christian merchant in Venice, also named Antonio, a popular name in Shakespeare, he borrows from that Jewish moneylender, Shylock, in order to help his friend, Bassanio, court the noble Portia. Um, uh, courtship was a lot more expensive in those days. You couldn't just take your date to, to Wahoos and, and expect to have any progress towards marriage. You, know, you really needed to spend lots of money and time. So Bassanio needs the money. His friend Antonio gets the money by borrowing from Shylock. And Shylock uh, uh, says in a moment of whimsy, because he says he wants to befriend his former rival Antonio, he says, I'm not really interested in the money. Let's just sign a, a contract for the fun of it. Oh, I don't know, a pound of flesh or something like that. Hmm? Antonio agrees, thinking it's uh, in the spirit of, of humor. Uh, Shylock, however, has an ulterior motive. He's hoping that Antonio will not be able to pay the bond in time. Shylock, by the way, comes from the Hebrew shalak, which is a cormorant, a bird of prey, 
a bird that devours flesh. Hmm? That's where the name comes from, where Shakespeare gets it. So um, he makes the argument, I'm not, re I, I'm not really interested. After all, what do I get if I get a pound of flesh? It's, it's, not, it's not worth as much as a pound of beef or mutton. You know, there's, not, there's really no gain. I'm doing this uh, as extending it as a gesture. Uh, so uh, what happens is Antonio seals to the bond and all of his commercial ventures fail, one after the other. Ships sink, they get lost. He doesn't have the money to pay the bond. Um, and Shylock is insisting that the bond be paid. So Portia, this noble woman who's intelligent and articulate, um, she decides to disguise herself as a, as a male uh, clerk, a law clerk, and she goes to present the case in the court of Venice before, before the doge. She says, um, let's offer you twice or three times the money that, that has been borrowed. Huh? And he says, no, look at this bond. It says clearly a pound of flesh. And the small print is cut off nearest the merchant's heart cut off that pound of flesh. So you have the handout in front of you, but what I'd like you to do is not read it, but just listen to it. Listen to the magnificence of this. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes a throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power does then show like as gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoke thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which if thou follow this strict court of Venice, must needs give sentence against the merchant there. Wow, could that man write? Huh? Could he write uh, and think and argue and analyze? I said this afternoon that 22 lines here of 10 syllables each, a veritable poetic encyclopedia of learning and culture. 22 lines which, from which you could conduct a whole semester long course on Western civilization, philosophy and theology, and jurisprudence and ethics and, and all of the history surrounding Christendom and the relationship between Jews and Christians and so on and so forth, uh, Old Testament and New. And then the dramatic ironies of a Christian lawyer who ought to understand the gratuitous nature of mercy but who nonetheless insists in a line prior to this that the Jew must be merciful. You see, mer mercy does not admit of compulsion or being forced. So Shakespeare is saying that although this is a beautiful set piece on mercy, that the very Christian culture in Venice does not fully understand what mercy is either. It's not just Shylock, the cruel man who insists on Old Testament justice, but the Christians themselves are oblivious to what, to what justice means. So here we have Shakespeare, the Christian humanist, speaking to us core at core, heart to heart, you know, and showing as nowhere else that the heart of mercy um, that lies at the center of his art is, is love. Mm -hmm. So by now I hope you see clearly the unity of mind in Shakespeare, how he understands the need for mercy and also this relationship between justice and mercy. He says, uh, and I could spend lots of time, but we're, we're getting close to our time of ending, uh, explicating this, 
The one thing I want to say is that he says uh, clearly with respect to mercy, um, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. And of course, you know this, and Shakespeare's contemporaries knew it without much more than that line. He's speaking about the Our Father, no? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive, or insofar as we forgive those uh, who have trespassed against us. Huh? So this is the benefit of having a Christian audience, no, in Shakespeare's time as well as our own. And here is a variation of the same theme we find in The Tempest and in Measure for Measure, that the rarer action is in virtue and in, in, than in vengeance. Huh? So the heart of Shakespeare is finally this heart of mercy. Now I'd ask you to keep in the back of your mind a series of questions related to poetry and literature. Of what use is poetry? What can imaginative literature teach us? Wouldn't it be better off studying fact rather than fiction? Surely, I hope, we can begin to see that here the answers to such questions are as follows. Poetry and literature rightly understood, and this I think is the purpose of, of the Newman Institute, teach us about the true, the good, and the beautiful. But more than merely teach us, since if we do not incarnate the truth, we become like that sad character in James who looks at his natural face in the mirror, refuses to act on what he knows, and goes away. What happens? He forgets the very man that he is. He forgets his very identity. And that, I think, is what, is what the relationship is between poetry and the practical world. So consider for a moment the great suffering in the world. You know? And this is where it becomes very practical and very personal. Broken lives, broken hearts, you know? trust betrayed, fidelity shattered, confidence destroyed. I would be willing to guess uh, that there is no one in this room that has not suffered an injustice or a hurt from the hands of another. Each of us has those wounds that have been inflicted by others sometimes by those closest to us, father or mother, brother or sister, priest or teacher, no? And we live with these wounds and they, they threaten to freeze us, to fix us in a set mood in such a way that we cannot grow, we cannot go beyond them. Huh? So this is the sad tale of human experience, the side of life that contemporary authors, Hemingway, Faulkner, Joyce, concentrate on, forgetting about the other side, the Genesis vi vision, as I mentioned. So Shakespeare was um, comprehensive in that he was not naive about these problems, huh? but he also had Christian hope, and he had this perennial wisdom that once flourished, you might say, in Western civilization. Now only a vestige of it remains. And I think there's no one in this room that does not understand what I'm saying. What are we to do with this maelstrom of sin and suffering of which we are in many cases the victims? No? What solution? What medicine? What remedy? Hmm? Only mercy and its closest companion, forgiveness. We have heard and seen, I hope, that Shakespeare provides an answer. And his is the same counsel that comes from the heart of a saint. This is St. John Paul II. Man and man's lofty calling are revealed in Christ through the, through the revelation and the mystery of the Father and his love. And he continues, man attains to the merciful love of God, his mercy, to the extent that he himself is interiorly transformed in the spirit of that love towards his neighbor. In a similar vein and with much the same spirit, Pope Francis more recently teaches, mercy is the very foundation of the church's life. The time has come for the church to take up again 
the joyful call to mercy. This in his papal bull uh, in the spring. So on a practical level, I ask you this evening, as I ask myself, is there in our heart anyone who we have not forgiven for any reason whatsoever? So often I hear the phrase, you've heard it too, I could forgive anything, but not that. I have a, a memory, sad memory from my high school days of a young man, senior at high school, who uh, perhaps he was drunk, perhaps drinking, fell off the Palisades, which overlooked the Hudson River, broke his neck, died. The funeral, as you could imagine, he was 18 years old, was quite sad. Italian family, uh, Augie Di Pietro was his name. I remember, as it was yesterday, going to the mother, trying to say that I was so sorry for the loss. And I remember her saying, and this is at a time when I was away from the faith, I had not yet come back to the faith. She said, I could forgive God for anything but not this, but not this. And even though I was away from the faith at the time, something in me said that there's something, there's something missing here. There's something, there's something wrong. The hard truth is this. It is precisely the not that, that thing that I will not forgive, which we must forgive in order to enter into the fullness of life, both here and hereafter. So as we begin this jubilee year of mercy, let's think about whether there is mercy in our own hearts, especially towards those who have done us harm, sometimes great harm, you know? Let's look at the wisdom of Shakespeare alongside of that, of tradition and scripture, the fathers, doctors of the church, all of whom sound the same symphony of mercy. God's mercy for us, and the mercy he asks of us for others. Realize that great freedom comes from mercy given, that miserable slavery comes from forgiveness withheld. Know as well that we have not within ourselves the power to forgive others. When the winds of forgiveness blow, it is clear to anyone who has forgiven, such forgiveness is not from us. We're not capable of such forgiveness, especially when great harm has been done to us. With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Finally, and I thank you for your patience tonight, I invite you to learn the lesson of greatness that Shakespeare teaches to those willing to learn. The rarest action is in virtue than in vengeance. Do we want the freedom of soul that comes from forgiving others? Or do we want the frozen hatred that Dante depicts in the depths of hell, where the tears of an anguished Satan freeze on his cheek because his heart is frozen, frozen in a fixed opposition to God? So we go to the God who is mercy, to Jesus who reflects the love of the Father, and we go by means of Mary, the mother of mercy. To borrow Newman's striking words from his dream of Gerontius, we go to him with that, quote, intemperate energy of love. We fly to the dear feet of Emmanuel. Our soul circles round the crucified and lies passive and still before the awful throne. O oh, happy suffering soul, for it is safe, consumed yet quickened by the glance of God. God bless you and your families, and thank you. Thank you for coming.